uh, help us and inspire us and teach us. You know, we sit here at the feet of our Lord and the saints and the great elder to learn uh, the secrets, as it were, the mysteries of the spiritual life and the life in Christ that's apparent here in the book Revelation. So as always, we begin, we begin with a look at the text that we're going to be examining tonight. We're going to be looking at most of, uh, all of seven, all of eight, and half of nine. And that will be, um, then the rest of nine will be picked up uh, in uh, in the next session. So let's read the Greek, and then we'll look at the English translations we have, including the Orthodox New Testament. Oechon us acusato. Tito pnevma legi tis ecclesias. To nikondi rosso afto fagin ec tu xilo tis zuis. O estinen to paradiso tu theu mu. Que to angelo tis en smirni ecclesias grapson. Tadi legi o protos, que o escatos. O se geneto nikros que esisan. Idasu ta erga. Que tin thlipsin. Και την φτωχία, αλλά πλούσιοσι και την βλασφημία εκ των λεγόντων Ιουδαίο είναι εαυτού, και ούτε συν αλλά συνολική του Σατανά. And in the King James, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And under the angel of the church, in, unto the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them that say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. So the RSV translation on the left in the Orthodox New Testament, which we're going to read and just note some very minor differences. Again, the one who hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. To the one overcoming, I will give to him to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of my God. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith the first and the last, who became dead and came to life. I know thy works, and the affliction, and the poverty but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who count themselves to be Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Okay, so we noted this in the previous session because we, we were covering, as it were, twice that seventh verse in, in, in part. And so we have a small difference in that we have my God in the Greek, Theomu, and in the King James, and it just says, of God, but the Orthodox New Testament has the proper wording, my God. Likewise, in the King James, we have the word tribulation for thlipsin, but the more accurate affliction is in the New Test Orthodox New Testament. Uh, and we'll leave the rest of nine for next week, or next time we get together in two weeks. So not, not really any substantial problems in the translation that I can see. Let's go to this first verse, number seven, all right? This, this first verse, uh, talking about the one who overcomes, the one overcoming. And here, uh, I should note, actually, that that this, uh, in the King James, we have overcometh, and in the Orthodox New Testament, we have overcoming. And here, they're focusing or stressing the continuous present, the continuous process of the uh, victory of the overcoming that it is not a one-time event that is in the past, but a continuous, uh, ever-increasing, uh, we hope, uh, status for all those who are uh, in Christ and struggling for their salvation. And to the one who's overcoming, I will give to him to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of my God. So let's talk about this first verse. All right, so... There is obviously a victory here for the faithful, the one who is overcoming, the one who is, has been victorious or is being victorious. Uh, this is a victory which is two-part. It's the victory of Christ 
but it's also our faith in him, our victory in him on our part. And that synergy is always present. And you have both and, as always, and the inseparable dogma and ethos. Once again, making itself very obvious here. So there's both his faithfulness. He is victorious. And he is always victorious. And this is the this is the confusion of some unfortunate uh, in the West, mostly. I mean, of course, the Orthodox, there are Orthodox who fall into this same trap, but it really is, originates in the West among the Protestants. This idea that his salvation, that he worked in the midst of the earth, crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension, this whole economy of salvation, which of course he was victorious, of course he was faithful until the end, that this imparting of resurrection from the dead and a, and a uniting of the body and soul eternally, uh, that is the victory. That no longer is man run asunder because of his walking out of paradise, or rather rejecting obedience in paradise, but now he's been restored in the new Adam, and that is eternal life. However, there is a resurrection unto life and a resurrection of the judgment. And so there requires on our part an embrace, an assimilation, a synergy, a, a cooperation with Christ. And that's why it's both and. It's both his victory and our faithfulness in him. And that grace, that salvation and theosis by grace, that gift is assimilated and applied and lived on our part. This, this uh, uh, passage from Galatians 2.16 I think shows this synergy, this double, uh, two-sided of the same coin salvation that we have to understand properly. Otherwise, we might end up thinking that salvation is simply a magical uh, event, so to speak. It's imparted to us. It's it's imputed to us, so to speak. We just kind of accept it. We just we accept it in mind. We make a, a declaration that we accept it, and that's it. But that's a very, very uh, mistaken, even heretical idea. It's nowhere to found, be found in the Holy Fathers. And it doesn't make any sense in, in, in the whole scheme of the patristic uh, reading of Scripture, as we see both in Galatians here in a minute and in Revelation and every, everywhere else, really. So we know from the Apostle Paul, who writes, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. And by the way, here, this translation in King James is more faithful than many other translations in English. The faith of Jesus Christ. And that is exactly what it says in the Greek. It doesn't say faith in. It says faith of. That's a literal rendering of the Greek. By the faith of Jesus Christ, his faithfulness, his victory, right? Even we have believed in Jesus Christ. We have his faithfulness, and then we have our belief in him our love of him, etc., that we might, through this, both and his faithfulness, the faith of Jesus Christ of the end, and our belief in him, that we might, through these, be justified by the faith of Jesus Christ. So we're, we're accepting his victory, we're, we're enjoying it, we're working together with it, and not by the works of the law. The life which I now live, he says later on, in the two or three verses later, that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. His faithfulness, his life, not I, but he who lives in me, he says in this, just before this, this is how I live now. His life is mine. I don't have my own life. His life is mine. He who loved me and gave himself for me. So this is our struggle. What is it that every Christian must be victorious in? What is this struggle? What is this that we must be victorious in? And that is rejection of and struggle against every dogmatic and ethical derailment and persistence. That's a continuous present, right? That's a overcoming, not something that overcometh in the past, but it's a continuous persistence in the first love. That is in the person of Jesus Christ and in our neighbor, the two uh, greatest commandments upon which all the law and the prophet saying, so right there, that's it. That's in summary, what is happening and what has to happen in our life. If we're going to be among the overcoming, the victorious, who will eat of the tree of life. That's a uh, 
quick look at that. Unfortunately, we have to be quick. We have a lot of things to say. So again, a look at this passage now to the part that has to do with the tree of life. I will give to him to eat of the tree of life. We have the tree of life promised by the Lord is a reference to the tree that was forbidden to Adam and Eve before they were expelled from paradise. In fact, their expulsion was precisely for this purpose, to keep them from eating from the tree of life so that they would not become immortal in their sin, thus making evil immortal, as the church fathers interpret. So it was, again, even this expulsion, like every penance, like every pedagogical means and tool, like everything that happens, everything the Lord does is pedagogical. It's for our salvation. So even this expulsion had a salvific reason behind it. It was not just a punishment. And this, again, is... And it's not untrue, but it's only a part of the story when the, when such things happen in scriptures and church history in our lives, when we suffer uh, from the fruits of our our uh, sin and uh, our apostasy. Well, even the quote unquote punishment is salvific, is meant to be pedagogical and to reverse things, to return us to our first love, and here. Not only that, is it protecting us from the worst possible outcome, and that is that if we had remained in paradise in that condition, sin would have become immortal. Right? We would not. We would. We would live in that fallen, sinful state forever. So the so death comes as a, as a benefit to man. It puts an end at some point to the fallen world, the fallenness. Now that happens in baptism. Now that happens in Christ, and he transformed that. When we died as a little old man, we were born again in baptism and chrismation and communion. And so that's put to an end, but in Christ. And the resurrection, of course, which all mortals, all those who have the soul separated from the body, it's, will, will be resurrected and returned. And so therefore, no longer is it at that end. No longer is it the end of the story where there is essentially it was before Christ, a quote-unquote permanent separation, right? There was no hope outside of the Messiah. The Messiah was was prophesied before, you know, basically written history. And from the beginning, from the fall itself, there was already a prophecy that there would become a Messiah and save mankind. And this is the salvation in Christ. So that had to happen. And this process had to happen, the separation of the body and the soul, precisely to save us from eating of the tree of life and therefore sin becoming immortalized and we becoming immortally sinful. Uh, as we all know, the door of paradise remains sealed and shut, speaking death entered creation. This is what happened. And uh, uh, let's talk now about this paradise of my God in this same uh, section. I will give eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of my God. So the fruit of the tree of life is offered by Christ himself, who opened the door, opened the road leading to the paradise of God. This expression of my God reminds us of another time when he says the same to the myrrh-bearing women. I'm ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Now, some might don't understand how the Lord, his nature, the theanthropic nature of the Lord, someone doesn't understand how the fathers interpret things, they might be confused and say, but he's the son of God, he's God. How does he say, my God, my father? Uh, and this refers, because this refers to the human nature of Christ, who opened the gates of paradise as God-man, as theanthropos, as God and man, right? So the the reference here is to his human nature. The incarnate Son of God, in essence, we're referring to his human nature here, was the person who struggled, worked, and led mankind back to the kingdom 
of God. So the human element here, which is essential, there has to be a synergy. There has to be one who goes forward and, and unites heaven and earth, unites God and man, unites human nature and divine uh, nature in his person. And that is what's referring to there, the my God. Uh, some might be confused by that. So let's look at 2 8. Verse 8 now. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things saith, saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. But let's look at the. These things saith the first and last who became dead and came to life. First of all, we're talking about the church of Smyrna. Where is that? What is that? Let's recap real quick. Remind ourselves, maybe we're not so fluent in geography. This is Asia Minor. You see Patmos at the lower left, across from Asia Minor. Ephesus is up the coast a bit, and further up is Smyrna, and furthermore is Pergamon. And then inland, you see Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and then Laodicea further down. This should give you a sense of what, what where these churches are, where Smyrna is. Now, we started with Ephesus. He's done with that epistle. Now we're in the epistle of, for Smyrna. So this is eight miles north of Ephesus. It's a Greek city, thoroughly ancient Greek city, south of Pergamos, as we said. A Jewish synagogue is in the center of this city, which is quite antagonistic and intolerant to the Christians. We'll talk about that next week when we look at that uh, phrase, who count themselves to be Jews and are not, but it's our synagogue of Satan. The elder will examine that. And here's another map to give you a sense of the whole region. Uh, of course, Africa below, Judea and the Middle East, Palestine on the right. And then that whole region there, Cappadocia, Cilicia, Galatia, Bithynia, Pondos, uh, these are ancient Christian areas. I mean, the heart of the heart of the church in many ways was Asia Minor for the vast majority of church history. That's where, of course, the apostles thoroughly missionized, and we have the great saints like the three hierarchs, and we have you know endless saints throughout the ages up until the 20th century, when because of the sins of the world, the sins of the churches, they were entirely lost. To Christians. Christians were expelled by the Turks in 1923. Actually, we're actually basically celebrating, celebrating, remembering this year the ninth the exchange of the population, 1922. And then you see the cities here on the map. You can see that they're they're fairly close to one another, as we saw. And there's a little phrase for each church for each church, which tries to sum up how the Lord characterized the churches. We talked about Ephesus and the criticism there that they had lost the first love. Now we're looking at Smyrna, and this is a persecuted church by the synagogue of Satan. And then we go to Pergamon, a compromising church. Theatira, a corrupt church. Sardis, a dead church. These are a little bit too simplistic anyway. Philadelphia, a faithful church. And Laodicea, a lukewarm church. So the two churches that are stand out as being more faithful, more, more true to Christ is Smyrna, which we're looking at now, and Philadelphia, of all the uh, churches in the, in the book of Revelation. All right, so I, hopefully that's helpful for all of us to orient ourselves. Now let's look at who is the recipient of this epistle. Well, of course, we have the father of all the saints of the day in the region, and that is the Apostle John up in the left-hand corner who write, was writing these epistles. We have the first bishop of Smyrna, who is St. Bucolos, Bucalas, and kind of an unknown saint to most people, but is, is definitely an, an ancient saint, a well-recognized saint within the Synaxarion of the church, and I recommend you read about his life. Uh, his sufferings in his uh, confession of faith. And then St. Polycarp, everybody knows who St. Polycarp is. He's even a favorite among the, he's even a favorite among the anti-patristic, non-patristic, uh, uh, innovative Westerners. Like the various Protestants seem to love him, but they don't really understand apparently 
how he is a disciple of the disciples and he is a confessor of the faith and he is of course a great uh, saint of the church and uh, of the church, in the church, for the church. Uh, it's amazing to see the disconnect in contemporary uh, Christian circles, Western Christian circles, uh, about the saints of the early church, how they don't they don't connect them to the whole context and the history of the church and the continuity of the church. Um, it's it's, fine, it's rather mind boggling. So that is Saint Polycarp, and of course, a great apostolic father and a higher martyr. Uh, and recommend highly recommend you read his his life. And so this epistle is going to him, and we have a very very basic an important teaching, very relevant to our days, as the gospel always is. The gospel, the scriptures, the New Testament is always relevant, always applicable to societies, but the individuals, and the book of Revelation is no different. So let's read what the elder has to say, and then we'll comment on it. The epistle of our Lord to the Bishop of Smyrna serves as a classic example for the heroes of the faith. These things saith the first and the last, who became dead and came to life. This introductory phrase of Christ, who's the sender of the epistle, is taken from the initial vision, which was already analyzed several weeks ago. It is relevant to the entire theme of the epistle, persecution, martyrdom, and death. That's the theme of the entire epistle, persecution, martyrdom, and death. It advises those who will be subjected, subjected to this persecution, martyrdom, or death not to be afraid. Fear not. Let no one fear death. Let no one fear death. Because the one who sends them this epistle and for whose sake they are suffering martyrdom and death is the one who became dead and lived again. In other words, what can they fear? Death? There's nothing harmful about death. Let me repeat that. There's nothing harmful about death. Why are people afraid of it? Well, they're afraid of it because they're not living in Christ. But for those who do live in Christ, it is a doorway to heaven. And there's nothing harmful and nothing to be afraid of. Fear not, for they know who the one is who's sending the epistle. The one who was dead and is alive again. So what is it a fear? Since he is alive and all those in him are alive. There are no saints who are dead. In other words, separated from Christ. In other words, they don't they have not experienced the spiritual death. They are eternally with God. They will resurrect by the power of the resurrected Son and Lord. Uh, let's see, Son and God, Son and Lord of God. And that's a typo there. This reminds me to make the announcement that you can go now to Amazon.com, plug in Let No One Fear Death. Let No One Fear Death. Um, I could bring that up really quickly here. Why don't I do that? And you can now obtain the, la the latest publication from uh, the Orthodox uh, publisher, Uncut Mountain Press. Uh, and we'll bring it up here really quickly. This is a collection uh, of, um, box, I cannot print here. A collection of essays we'll share with you right now, just a second. All right, there it is. And this is now on sale at Amazon. Everyone who's interested in these, uh, this book, obviously that's to go and check it out and uh, buy a copy right now. It just came out two days ago, three days ago. And it is a collection of uh, essays from a number of Orthodox Christian scholars uh, on the uh, whole COVID phenomenon. Let's see if we can get the paper table of contents here for you. 
and you can uh, see what is going to is in here. So we have a nine chapters, I think it is, or is it uh, yeah, eight chapters, eight lectures. Uh, Metropolitan Jonah Paffhausen has an introduction. Chapter one is kind of an introduction. Uh, Catherine uh, Baker, a pandemic observed. Uh, Irene Polizulis has several essays as a physician and what she lived through and understood the spiritual lessons uh, through the whole COVID uh, uh, saga. Uh, Deacon Ananias uh, Sorum, is a, who is a PhD in uh, theology philosophy. In whom do you put your trust in orthodox analysis of COVID science? Father Alexander Webster, the moral peril of taking most COVID-19 vaccines and yours truly the demonic methodology of the coronavirus narrative. Uh, so recommend you check it out. Let no one fear death now available. It's only available, unfortunately, for a variety of reasons through, uh, through Amazon. All right. Check it out. Let us know. And we'll pick up again um, where we left off. So here, this theme, obviously, going back to the early church, now we're dealing with it again, with this fear of death through the whole COVID insanity. And now the the, the, the eternal word of God comes and tells us through the, uh, the epistle and to the great higher martyr, Polycarp, there's nothing to fear. The entire theme of the epistle is that this is a lot of Christians. This is, this is how we walk in this world. We are persecuted, we are martyred, and uh, we do not fear death in the midst of this, uh, this life before we are with the victor over death and over all the delusions and lies of Satan. Let's read what St. Andrew of Caesarea, the great uh, commentator on the book of Revelation, has to say about this passage. As God, he is first. Remember that he says, these things say at the first and the last. As God, he is first. As a human being, he is last. He is first because he is the one who existed before all beings. He is last in the context of the human nature because he received the created human nature at a latter time, in the latter days, uh, the eschata, right? So that's a very nice uh, way to understand and explain. Why does he say the first and the last? Now let's go on to 2.9. Two nine. Two nine. I know thy works and the affliction and the poverty, but thou art rich. These three words we're going to examine, spend a lot of time examining, very important, especially poverty. So we have three different things here. I know thy works, the affliction, and the poverty. These are the three stranded rope, as Elder Athanasios uh, calls it, the three stranded rope, which pulls the Christian on the journey of holiness. The works, the affliction, and poverty. Have you thought about that? Has anybody ever occurred to you these are the three things that pull you on the journey of holiness? The works, the affliction, cross, suffering, and poverty. Poverty. It's going to be very interesting to hear uh, comment here hear on these three things. So let's start with number one, the works. I know thy works. What are works? So most people say, well, works are, are philanthropy, almsgiving, right? The love of the neighbors or whatever it might be, the various works that people engage in as Christians. They try to live out their, their faith and they, the fruit of the grace of God and the synergy with God is going to lead them to do uh, actions which are expressions of their love for Christ and their love for the neighbor. <coughs> but it's not just that. It's also the whole life and conduct of the faithful. So when you think of works, get out of the, whatever you preconceived notion you might have under the influence of various theological schools and sectarians who have written to tome after tome about works and faith, etc. And let's just try to understand here simply what the book of Revelation has to say. Life and conduct, the whole life, the whole struggle, the whole ethos that you're acquiring, the whole way of life, all of it can be can be termed as it works. So Elder Athanasius says, one can be bedridden. He can be a mere pauper, have no money whatsoever. It doesn't have to be almsgiving at all, right? He can be full of good works, even if he has no money. Even if he has... No ability to do anything. He's just in bed. He can be full of good works. There's nobody who can't be full of good works. Even the person who's 
paralyzed in their bed. Why is that? How is that possible? Well, the works are his life and his conduct. So everything he can do, or you know, in the realm of what he can do, whatever it is, however limited he is, whatever that he does in that context are his works. The way he lives, in spite of the various limitations, the way he lives, the way he exists with his patience. So his patience in suffering is his works, his offering to Christ, right? his endurance, his faith, his love, lack of grumbling in the midst of temptations, uh, not, not being a, a complainer, not being somebody who's constantly negative, grinding, this is not good, I don't like that, I don't get this, like little baby who doesn't get the toy and all the rest. How many people are still immature children and have not grown into the stature, they're even close to the stature of Christ because they're constantly grumbling, they're complaining, they don't have joy, right? So lack of grumbling, joy, regardless of the pain and poverty, all these are works. There's nobody here tonight that cannot carry out and, 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 and grow in the perfection in Christ in their life and conduct. In other words, to give works, good works back in, in gratefulness to God. So the Lord will say to us, I know the way you lived, how you thought, how you talked, how you mo moved about, how you influenced other people, and much more can be said. He says, I know, the Lord will say, I know all this. I know you're in and out. I know the heart. So there's nothing you can say, well, I, 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 I couldn't, I didn't, I didn't, you know. No, all of us will give an account how we thought, everybody thinks, how we lived, everybody's alive. How we talked, everybody mostly can talk, or at least they can, to some degree, communicate, usually. How you move about, and whatever that might mean, and how you influence other people. So pretty much our whole life and conduct, right? So we may not be able to practically assist others for whatever reason. We might be impoverished. We might have physical problems, right? We can, however, feel pain inside in our heart out of love, right? The pain of heart that, that comes from love. We can have that. And we can cry out to God. No one is, is a human being and he's alive, even severely handicapped. In the heart, they can cry out to God. And they can say, Lord, help this man or these men or these homeless or the refugees or the jobless or whoever it might be. And that's an offering, right? We can do that. So everyone is on board here for this question. And let's go to number two now. We're going to go, we did works, we'll go to afflictions, tribulation as King James puts it. So in this context, we're not talking about so-called worldly affliction. And we'll explain ourselves here. We're talking about the attack from the servants of Satan. Remember, we're going to go next week to the, about the synagogue of Satan and the persecution, the suffering church of Smyrna. So we're talking about the persecution of the Christians, the attacks of Satan and his, the demons and the, and the co-workers on this earth with demonic, the demonic uh, you know, the demons, and their attack on a man who's doing God's will. So we won't have affliction in this sense if we're not doing God's will. We will not be worthy of that affliction. We will not be called one who suffered with Christ if it's not for God and in God, right? And he, we're suffering for his sake and his namesake. Blessed are you, he says, those who, those who are uh, rejected and despised for my name's sake. He, that's what the Lord says. He doesn't say just generally despised, but for my name's sake, blessed are you. So this is the affliction which is brought about by the contrary and God-opposing forces who are against God's works. When they see a godly man doing a good work, this is when the demons get really upset and attack through their minions and through their servants and through their the, the passions of man. So it is impossible to be a true Christian and to be without affliction. So all true Christians are going to enjoy the fruit of this work, of this labor. Because they to be a true Christian means you are afflicted. If your life is really easy, really 
worldly. You know, you're getting all the pleasure that you need and want. You're not suffering. You're not, you know, pain of heart for the world and all the rest, but you're just kind of cruising along and doing your thing. You don't have to, you're not getting out of your house and not getting out of your world to suffer or care about other people around you and all the rest. You're not suffering for the sake of your neighbor. It's not a good sign. I don't, we don't, we got to wonder, are we true Christians? He goes on, the Lord never gave us the assurance of salvation before our death. Let me repeat that. The Lord never gave us assurance of salvation before our death, like some sort of salvation certificate issued by some Protestant sectarians. I'm quoting Elder Athanasius here. This is a heresy. This idea, you get your certificate, the Lord gives it to us, and that's it. We're, gonna, we're saved. There's no such thing. It's delusional. The Lord assur assurance is in this world you affliction. That's the assurance, not the other kind of assurance. Now, what kind of affliction? It would not entail the affliction caused by our own sins. That would be worldly affliction. Okay, we sin and then we have affliction because of that. We're suffering because of our stupidity or our arrogance or we blew all the money on gambling. You know, people suffer from all that. That's not the suffering we're talking about. That's not the affliction that, that is salvific. Um, we'll talk about well, what do you do with those cases? Like, what is there any way to redeem them? We'll talk about that in a second. But that's not what they're talking about here in this passage. So it would mean, it would not mean to have affliction if, for example, my business failed or to be afflicted by loss of money or loss of a career or because someone sold my car or my belongings or because I suffered damage from an earthquake or because a flood destroyed my farm, my cabin and all the rest, right? These are everyday worldly afflictions and being distressed in this manner does not necessarily give you give us a ticket to the kingdom of God, all right? So let's, this is really important. In our mind, what kind of affliction is salvific? What kind of affliction is of this world and is a part of this world? And people suffer day and night from various earthquakes and thieveries and all the rest. Now, we'll talk about what about those in a second. But that's, first of all, you have to understand, that's not what we're talking about here in the book of Revelation and what's really uh, praised uh, by our Lord, right? So what about these everyday worldly distress, this everyday worldly distress? What about it? Is it no play, plays no role in our salvation? We can't do anything about that? So accidents, diseases, the loss of a home to fire, the loss of a job, the loss of 10 acres of corn to drought, etc. If that, if we suffer those things and, and, both and, I do not grumble, I do not curse God, well, then these things can be used for our salvation. This can turn into a blessing. So those things can be blessings, can be helpful in our, in our path of salvation because essentially that's an exercise of trust and patience, right? And loving and not being distraught and anxious. But you gotta not grumble. You gotta not curse God. You gotta not have tons of anxiety. Like there's end of the world, you gotta trust God. Only then do those daily afflictions become salvific. All right, so that's a little bit about afflictions. There could be more. Uh, I encourage all of you, if you have not, to acquire the, the book, the five volumes, at least the first volume, which we're going through, uh, by uh, uh, Zoe Press. This is, the, this is our, our, our uh, let's see if we can get that. There we go, right? If you don't have this, you should probably go out and get it. You, you can order from Zoe Press dot, I want to say U.S., U.S.A., I don't remember, actually, let's see. Dot us right all right so um obviously i'm not going to be able to present the whole gamut the whole chapter word by word so there's much more on the question of affliction there but that's the basic rundown right so you have two kinds of affliction the one is absolutely salvific because it's for christ and um, because for the sake of christ and he promises that all of us who share in sufferings for his name we are blessed the other kind even if it is a, something that we're culpable with, if we are repentant, humble, patient, we don't grumble, we don't complain, then there can be a redemption there and a salvific uh, 
uh, training in virtues, right? We're, we're, we're carrying our cross and we're being patient and, and hoping in God. Those are all good things. So let's talk about the poverty. We're going to have a lot about poverty tonight because the elder focuses a lot on, on this question. And very interesting, very, very interesting. So pay attention. The meaning of poverty here, the meaning of poverty. Remember, he says, I know thy works and thy affliction and thy poverty, the poverty, not the, the, the poverty. But thou art rich. How can they be poor and yet rich? So let's unpack what the terms here really mean. The criterion of our entrance into the kingdom of God is love expressed in sacrifice and in almsgiving. We know that from the scriptures. And these two that I'm going to give to you now are going to set, kind of lay down some foundation for us how to understand poverty. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say, this is from James, he's talking about the working out of love and almsgiving and philanthropy, right? And one of you say to this one who's destitute or naked, you say, depart in peace, be warmed and filled. Notwithstanding, you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? So obviously, uh, we cannot talk about true love, and we cannot talk about uh, being on the path of salvation if we turn in a basic way the basic needs of our fellow human beings, we turn a blind eye. We are not on the path of salvation. So that is definitely a question of like poverty here is real. It's a problem and we need to be about fixing it. All right, first step. Second thing, we have the criteria from Matthew 25, 35, 36. We have the criteria where clearly as there's two categories, the sheep and the goats and the sheep are the ones who saw Christ in their fellow man and fed him and clothed him and visited him, right? And those who were not lovers of Christ, not lovers of fellow man, they did not clothe the naked. They did not take them in who were strangers. They did not give the thirsty to drink, right? And they did not visit them in prison. So that's obviously a criteria of salvation. And obviously in this case, the Lord is expecting us and wanting us to relieve the poverty, the stress, and all the rest of our fellow man. So poverty is ultimately the result of ethical evil. Ultimately, poverty is the result of this fallen world and the evil that men uh, embrace in a variety of forms. The, the rich ignore the needs of their brothers. That's how they become super rich, right? If you're getting millions and hundreds of millions and billions of dollars, you're not, and you're, you're not obviously, you're hoarding that. You're not giving it to the, those in need. You're turning away, and that is an ethical evil, right? The distance of man from God. That's the basic cause, that we're not in God and with God and in Christ. Uh, so this poverty is a curse, right? Lack of fruitfulness, we say, and rain, it's a curse. It's a cause. It's the cause of poverty for many people. When they don't have uh, rain for their fields, they can't uh, produce any fr fruit, uh, they can't go to the market, they become impoverished. So the, there's many references in the prayers of the church that this not be the case. Like it's clearly the church is praying for, for, as we say in the divine liturgy, the abundance of the fruits of the earth, peaceful times, favorable weather. We pray for that. We beg God to give those things. So then it is a result of sin, poverty, and all the rest that leads there. The mystery of marriage, for instance, we pray fervently in the wedding service the newlyweds be blessed with earthly goods. The whole congregation, the whole people of God entreats God. Help this new couple, this new family to be given what they need to have earthly goods. And so we, we pray to God for an end to poverty and an end to all the uh, suffering and all the rest. Uh, and we clearly see in several passages of scripture that poverty is an apocalyptic scourge. Go, we're going to go this uh, a couple weeks or months, probably. I don't know what, exactly when we're going to get there. Revelation 6, 8. And the power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beast of the earth. So it is obviously considered a great evil, these things, right? By the way, very interesting point that he makes in the book that is rather frightening. This was 40 years ago. And he says that in the book of 
Revelation, the fourth of the earth will be killed. The fourth of the earth. Now, the fourth of the earth in, in the first century is nothing like a fourth of the earth in the 21st century. Do we have seven billion now? What are we up to? Almost seven billion? A fourth of the earth, a couple billion will be killed in the end times. A couple billion. Uh, and of course, that's possible today, isn't it? Never been possible before the 20th century. That you know, they were fighting in the first century with spears and stones and things like that. How are you going to kill a fourth of the world in the first century? Today, we can do that. Today, easily a fourth of the world could be obliterated in a nuclear war or, or, or massive world war three uh, with all kinds of terrible weapons that we have that are available today. So um, so that is definitely seen as a terrible evil brought about by apostasy and the demons and all the rest. Also, it's clear that the Lord wants to eliminate this poverty. I know people say, well, the poor you have always with you. That is a, both a prophecy and a, just a simple statement of fact by our Lord. Nonetheless, he would like to see it eliminated, even though he knows it will not be. Uh, and we read in Matthew 14, 20, and they did all eat and were filled, and they took up the fragments that remained 12 baskets full. What is the point here? That the Lord was caring for the people. They were in the desert. They needed to eat. He definitely didn't want them to suffer from hunger. And elsewhere in Mark 8, 2, I have compassion on the multitude, he says, the Lord says himself, because they have now been with me three days and have nothing to eat. So he comes and he gives this example of us feeding thousands, the multitude, right? He definitely does not want to see us suffer from uh, this impoverishment and this, uh, this uh, uh, hunger. And then the elder says, commenting on this whole situation, the Lord wanted to cure this state of hunger and he eliminates this evil from his brothers and eliminate uh, this evil from his brothers. Yes, when you see your neighbor in the state of poverty, you must help him. It was without saying as Christians, we're going to help our fellow man, our neighbor, out of situations as much as we can uh, if we have the means. Now, we talked about Poverty, a curse. Now we're going to go to poverty, a blessing. Not just a curse, there's a blessing. In fact, there's a great blessing from poverty. When it's voluntarily chosen, it's a great blessing. It's, a, it's to be sought after. We read in Matthew 5, 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit by their own will. This is a question of interpretation. that produced the interpretation, the, the Greek grammar. You'll see here why we put this in brackets. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Actually, the in spirit is a little bit of a bad translation in English. Um, it's not quite accurate. We'll talk about that in a second. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So some church fathers say this is about humility. Some say it's about humility and poverty. And I think that's the, that's the most accurate, uh, is that it's both. So... Let's examine a little bit with the elder here. What is going on with the, these phrases in, in Greek? We'll look at the Greek a bit. Makari. Makari is the, the blessed, plural, those, those who are blessed. Blessed, makari, blessed are the poor. Topnevmati. Right? In spirit, we translate it, the Greek term is en topnevmati, right? Uh, but it's not in spirit as much as it is the poor by their own spirit, meaning blessed are the poor by their own free will. In other words, voluntary poverty. Blessed are the those who are voluntarily poor. They choose poverty. Blessed are those who choose poverty. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So this topnevmati, it's the Greek there that we're translating as in spirit, but it's not so, so accurate. In the Greek grammar is the third declension of a noun. And it's pointing to method. In other words, how one is poor. We have the first declension, topnevma. The second declension, tupnevmatos. The third declension, topnevmati. So the first is the spirit. The second is of the spirit. And the third is with, by, or through the spirit. So, Blessed are those who are poor through the Spirit, with the Spirit, by the Spirit. 
All right, so it's talking about the method of being poor. That's the that's the best interpretation here that we can get if we're literally understanding and looking at the at the grammar. So voluntary poverty is blessed. As we see in the other parts of scripture, let's see what he says to the rich man. He says, if thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast and give to the poor. And thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. Clearly praising voluntary poverty, saying even here is a prerequisite for being a full-fledged disciple. You want to be free? You want to have your treasure in heaven? You want to be free from all the, the anxiety and the cares of the world? Sell everything. Give it to the poor and come follow me. And of course, that's when he says, very hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. We'll talk about that in a second. Blessed are the poor, but not just blessed are the poor, but woe to the rich. Woe to the rich. As I've said in many homilies, and some I think are online, about the God, about the God, the gospel, which speaks about the man who was very rich, and he and he said, "What am I going to do? What am I going to do with my soul? What soul? What should I do? I'll build up a whole bunch of, uh, you know, new uh, buildings to store all my goods in, and I'll, I'll eat, drink, and I'll be merry." And then the Lord says, "You fool! Tonight your soul is required of you." Now, in many of these references, we, I would think, most of us would tend to think of the rich as those really rich people like hundreds of millions of dollars or the you know maybe a hundred million or, or, or i'm sorry a million or two million or whatever right it's not us like we're just poor really comparatively but if we understand it richness and poverty not just with a dollar amount after the name but how we live today with what ease and comfort we live today and then we compare ourselves to almost the whole of human history before the all of this technology was developed we, even us poor today, we live like kings. Because of technology, we live like kings. Unbelievable things that they couldn't even imagine. The ease by which we live today, they can't even imagine. The travel, uh, the, the, uh, the food that's at our, at our disposal, and on and on and on and on. These things make us like kings of old. Kings couldn't do half the stuff that we do today. So... Do not put yourself outside of the category of the rich. That would be a fatal mistake. You would not be applying the gospel and the words of the Lord to yourself. And then it would be a waste, a grave waste of the wisdom and the teaching of the fathers and all the rest is to help us on the path of salvation. So blessed are the poor, but woe to the rich. Why? Why is the one blessed and the other not blessed? Okay. The Lord says, and he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, now, in Luke, it's very clear, whereas in uh, was it Matthew, it wasn't so clear. Um, and that is, blessed are the, blessed be ye poor. All right. So he's talking to the poor and he makes an unequivocal, uh, very obvious uh, statement. Can't be misinterpreted. Uh, he's saying right out the bat, you are poor, you're blessed. For yours is the kingdom of God. So he's clearly talking about poverty of the common kind, not just humble-mindedness, but poverty. The people who are poor are blessed. But woe unto you that, that are rich, he says in 624, a little bit later. So in Luke, it's not just blessed are the poor, but woe unto the rich. For ye have received your consolation. Right? We also remember, immediately we should remember the rich man and Lazarus. What does it say there? Remember that thou in thy lifetime, rich man, receivest thy goods, right? Same phrase there almost. Received your consolation, received your goods, right? You're consoled. Everybody wants to be consoled today. Everybody feels like they're suffering today. I mean, who? many people. We all looking for consolation. That's why the devil leads us so easily into sin. Oh, I want to be consoled. Well, I get that drug really consoles me for about an hour, and then I'm, you know. Or the sexual relations, the porn fornication, the adultery, porn pornography, all these things which are essentially like drugs that console us for a short time, but then throw us even further down into despair if we're, if we're actually interested in the salvation of our soul. 
Uh, so everybody's looking for constellation. He says, you have, you rich, you have your constellation. And what does that mean? You won't have the other constellation. Because you're not sharing, you're not loving, you're not sacrificing with those around you. Somebody say, well, I'm not a socialist, I'm not a communist, we're capitalists here. Well, the two extremes, neither of them should be our path. Capitalism, communism, the various extremes, they all belong to the devil. The royal path is the third way that's very rare, but it is the way of the orthodox. It's not going to go to the two extremes. We're not going to take people's things away from them, like communism, right? Come and say, without you wanting it, we're going to take it away, because there's no virtue in that. There's only vice in that. And there's no virtue for the person. He's not going to get any closer to Christ because you just stole all of his hard work, you know, or earned money, or even if it's not hard earned. Uh, so um, the those who look for consolation in any way in this world are going to be sorely uh, surprised when they depart this life because they looked in con for consolation in the wrong places. And it had no eternal significance. And it ended quickly, usually very quickly, but it ended in this life. It wasn't going to, you cannot take that with you into heaven. There's only one way and one place for true consolation. And of course, that's in Christ and for Christ and in his body, the church. So you have your consolation, you receive your good things, likewise, Lazarus, evil things. But now he is comforted and thou art tormented. Of course, his conscience is not just uh, his company with the demons, of which he became uh, uh, he became like them, and he dwells with, dwelled with them here. Because when you follow after your passions, you become a follower after the demons, and not an imitator of Christ. So, what do we want? We want consolation in the next life, and beginning in this life in Christ, but the only true consolation. Or are we going to spend our life essentially trying to keep uh, afloat a sinking ship, which is our fallen body and this fallen world? It says elsewhere, Woe unto you that are full, for ye shall hunger. So that fullness, which of course the rich man's table is always full, right? Has everything he needs. Woe unto you. Woe unto you. If we're honest, we're in that category, most of us. We don't have any problems. Just go to the supermarket, get whatever you want. Oh, I can get my favorite food, my favorite out. Go out, spend $100, don't want me to blink an eye. You know, I go to really nice restaurants. Woe unto you. Woe unto you. Lord have mercy. Woe unto the rich, but woe to the rich who does not care for the fact that poverty may exist for others. Okay, so slight modification and a more emphasis the elder gives us, and I think that's right, because of course there are wealthy men like Abraham, like Job, who were saved, right? So it's not, he doesn't say it's impossible to the rich man, about the rich man to the disciples. He doesn't say it's impossible. He says anything that's impossible with men is possible with God, right? So Woe unto the rich who have no care for their brother who's poor. Woe unto the rich who takes no action for the sake of the poor and relieve their suffering. So it's all about love. It's another uh, context for the same working out of love of neighbor and love of Christ. But those who hoard and do not give, they're not on that path. So now we're going to go even deeper into the question of poverty. All right. So the poverty, which is a blessing. Let's talk about this. And I highly recommend you go to the book, if you have it, or go buy it, and you read the full exposition by Elder Athanasius. We're not going to be able to present the whole thing, obviously, tonight. So this is a summary, quick summary of his great uh, and wise uh, presentation. So very important here. A blessed poverty is a poverty chosen for the sake of Christ. And we say this all the time, everywhere, as much as we can, for Christ and in Christ. For Christ and in Christ. That's the key all over the place, everywhere you look. It's got to be for Christ and in Christ. If it's not, it doesn't have eternal significance. So there's different kinds here. We're going to look at each kind. 
There's voluntary poverty for Christ. That's what we're shooting for. That's the, the blessing. There's involuntary forced poverty. And this is usually bad and it's a heavy burden. It's not the kind that's a blessing. Involuntarily, right? Forced poverty is not going to be. Of course, it depends on how you receive that terrible condition. It could be very, it, depending on our, our synergy with God's grace and our humility and all the rest, as we said earlier, it could be salvific. That's not the kind of poverty we're talking about here that's sought after. And the third, voluntary poverty, not for Christ. It has no meaning at all. There's no eternal meaning to that. And there are a lot of different sects and maybe even, you know, various uh, movements, ideological, whatever, even health things that people do. They, you know, they, they, they go down this path for earthly reasons and they are voluntarily impoverished. There are people in the streets. We just don't want to work. Now, I don't think many, but there are. They exist. And they would rather just live on the streets and be poor. That's not going to be salvific. If it's not for Christ and in Christ. So for this poverty to have any eternal dimensions, it must be voluntary and it must be grounded in Christ. All right. So two basic points here. Voluntary and in Christ. Now, all of this leads Father Elder Athanasius to point out seven basic theological dimensions to this poverty, this blessed voluntary poverty. And I'll say them here, and then we'll go through each one, and we'll listen to what the elder has to say uh, before we uh, wrap it up tonight and, and open up the questions. The first is, it frees the soul for spiritual flight from the material weight of wealth. Frees the soul from spirit for spiritual flight from the material weight of wealth. Okay, so Lots of wealth, lots of money. It ties you down. You are constantly thinking about it. What am I going to do with this? How am I going to spend that? Where am I going to? Go? That's the kind of slavery that you that people voluntarily choose. Of course, they're filled with various passions that lead them to want to have. It's, they're looking for security. I think there's a lot of people in the world who don't have a relationship with God, don't believe in God, don't believe in Christ. And what do they do? They give all their attention to money to banking, to having, you know, successful businesses. They become very wealthy. And that is mainly, re the main reason why they do that is not just for greed, but they have great insecurity. They are super insecure. And what happens is they got to have some security in this world, right? So if you get rich and you can buy things and have a big house and buy insurance and all this stuff, well, you have this false sense of security and you live this life and it's, tragic because in that bubble of security you won't feel the impending death that's coming you won't you won't be forced to suffer and to look at the suffering of other people and to realize this vain world will come to an end and very quickly and so voluntary poverty frees you from all of that and you're able to fly spiritually up into the heavens number two an excellent escort Voluntary poverty is an excellent escort for one on the spiritual life. It helps the spiritual life. It helps people get make progress in the spiritual life. Number three, it establishes dependence on Christ at each moment. You have to rely on Christ when you don't have these false securities that people want to surround their life with. The hope, number four, the hope of the faithful is placed in heavenly wealth. We have our treasure. We have hope and we have a security that... We've growing and we're putting uh, our uh, our treasure in the heavenly vault, which will never be taken away. Number five, the faithful person is flexible and receptive to confession, to missionary work, to martyrdom, right? When you are free and you're flying and you're on your ascent, you're not afraid to confess the faith. You're not afraid to do work for the church without anything in return, to the mission work, whatever form. And you're not afraid of dying and for Christ, right? Why do we have such a weak confession of faith today from many Orthodox Christians? Why do we have so few people who are actively confessing the faith, resisting innovation, resisting ecumenism, resisting philatism, resisting secularism? Relatively speaking, it's not a lot. It doesn't seem to be a lot. And why is that? Well, we're all attached to things. We don't want to lose them. Oh, you're going to get sacked as a priest. You're going to be defrocked. You're going to be run out. They're not going to want you in the parish because you're telling them 
these things are right or whatever, right? There's a thousand and one examples. You don't lose your job because you're telling them you, you don't go with the whole woke insanity, right? People don't want to do that. Why? Because they're attached. They're weighed down. They're enslaved. They're not free. So voluntary poverty enables someone to be super flexible. Oh, I got to move this house. I got to lose this house. That's all right. It doesn't matter. I got to, I got to, you know, move to the other side of the country to, to you know, whatever. I mean, it, they're not tied down. All right. Number six, it is the denial, voluntary poverty for Christ, the denial of the recreation and remodeling of a world which will vanish in its present form. What are we talking about? We're talking about the social gospel. In other words, what? That we're focused on building a utopia in this world. This is the spirit of Antichrist. This is the spirit of the future Antichrist will come here and he'll promise to give everyone salvation from poverty, from hunger, and all the things in this world that people so want to avoid. He will bring it and he will, people will love him, right? The, the, the path that prepares the way for Antichrist is this Love of civilization being built on this earth as if we're going to live here for eternity. Giving ourselves over for programs and 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 uh, agendas and oh uh, you know the so much of the world expends their energy on these vain pursuits. And the most absurd examples, of course, are the are the great reset folks, the the build back better insanity. You know, the oh yes, of course we're going to build the utopia on the earth. So much of it. Transhumanism, all of this is this right here. So if you are voluntarily poor, you turn away from these things, you're free from them. Not only will you be able to you, you'll be able to spot them because you'll have a discernment, right? You'll have a freedom and, and, the, and mindfulness, and God will illumine you as one who's not attached, but you'll be able to avoid it, you'll be able to resist it, you won't go along with it, uh, and you won't fall into the delusion of the utopias. Number seven, it makes the faithful similar to the one who became poor voluntarily, our Lord. All right, now let's look at each one separately and listen to what the elder has to say. And then I think we're almost finished for the night. Number one, the church fathers often repeated and accentuated that the inflow of blood or materials, right? In other words, not just literally blood, but the inflow of the materials of this world, goes along with the outflow of the Spirit. Spirit of God, this should be capitalized. In other words, these are inversely proportional sums. Inversely proportional. One goes up, the other one goes down. That's how it works, right? You can't have both. The more money you try to make, the less spiritual life, spirituality you will keep. The more money you try to make, the richer you want to be, the less likely, the less spiritual life, spirit of God you will have. It's a rule. You might say, well, well, almost impossible, right? There are exceptions. They are extremely detached, and yet they are they are essentially economy, right? They're 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 managers of God's wealth, and that's a rare thing. People consider everything they have to be theirs. None of it's theirs. It's all going to be left here. You don't. You might have. You might have worked for it and you might have earned it. You might have gotten it through some kind of scheme. I don't know how you got it, but it's not yours. You are a steward of it, right? People who work for it to get it and to keep it, that's what he's talking about here. Spiritual life, are in, it's, it's incompatible with such a stance in this world. It shows one who's not free. He's not, not giving himself over and trusting Christ implicitly. What does the, what the Lord say? The Son of Man has no resting place. No way to lay his head. The example of our Lord was, was that he was not attached to anything in this world, obviously. So according to the word of the Lord, wealth and spirituality are not compatible. The rich man and the spiritual man are so incompatible that the Lord's words astonished the disciples when he stated, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And remember, we're all rich today. We're all rich. Of course, we're not as rich as others. There's a hierarchy of spectrum, right? But comparatively the thousands of years of humanity, technology has made us as if we're kings, right? So just remember that. In ancient Greek, camel 
just so you understand the meaning of this passage, camel also was also the name for the thick ropes they used to tie ships on the dock. All right, so basically the same impossibility uh, is, is whether you actually think it's a camel, the animal, or a camel, meaning the ropes, which is more plausible, it's still impossible, right? Camel to go through the eye of the needle. The camel is like this thick rope and the eye of the needle is this. It's not going to happen. So he's saying it's basically without God, it's impossible. He says it, what is impossible, however, with men is possible with God. Some rich will enter the kingdom of God, like Abraham, but they are few, very few, very few. And one of the reasons why the end of the world will be so few people being saved is because we will all be as we already are in many places, not everywhere in the world, but first world, et cetera, et cetera. We're super rich. It's very hard to be saved when you're super rich. The odds are dangerously low, and the only the person uh, and only the person understands his realities of the gospel, uh, only the person who understands the realities of the gospel will be saved, even though he may be wealthy. In other words, very few will be saved who are, are wealthy. Only those who really understand the gospel and live it and are detached from the things that they are, they are let's say, stewards over. Uh, so that's not too many. We shouldn't say, oh, that's me. I, I'm one of those. Uh, I don't think you should assume that at all. Uh, we, many of us don't see ourselves, right? We see what we want to see. We create an idol of ourselves, right? We say, oh, yeah, I'm not, yeah, I'm not like that other rich guy. I give 10% to my church. Okay, but you got millions. So what are you going to do with that million? What's it, what's it for? Well, I'm going to have my children, I'm going to give my children, have them all taken care of. So then they're going to be rich and lazy, and they're not going to have the virtues because they're, you're going to pass on that, what exactly to them? What is it that you're going to pass on to them? Give them an example of a Christ-like person who gave away, supported the gospel, supported the building of the church, supported the salvation of souls. That's the best inheritance you can give to your children. God takes care of them. He'll take care, he took care of you. He'll take care of them. You don't need to save up, save up, save up, keep invest, make more money, make more money. That resembles somebody who doesn't have trust in God and does not understand the vanity of this world and is not living for the eternal life. Number two, spiritual voluntary poverty is an excellent and irreplaceable guide or escort for one in the spiritual life. St. Paul provides us with a wonderful picture of this with what he says in, in, the, in, in Philippians. He was in jail when he wrote this. He was in Rome, and he could not work to earn a living. He worked with his hands as a tent maker. So the Philippians sent him some money. What more appropriate thing for the children to send to their suffering father money, right? And he writes them, and he says what? I have learned in whatsoever state I am, poor, rich, in prison, outside, whatever, therewith to be content. He's free. He is a free man. Nothing bothers him externally, only to be with God. If he's with God, then he's free. I know both how to be abased and how to be to abound, right? To be impoverished and to be, uh, you know, abound, abounding with the material needs and good things. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Notwithstanding, you have done well, that you did communicate with my affliction. In other words, you were a, a, a co-worker and a co-sufferer, right, with me. You did well. You did well. But as far as I'm concerned, I don't need it. It doesn't matter to me. I don't have need of it. So, as the elder says here, when I have plenty of food, I do not eat like a glutton. When I am hungry, I have learned not to blaspheme God. I mean, this is the stance of one who is not attached. He's free. I have everything I need, and I abound, the apostle says in 418. And the elder says very beautifully, I mean, I wish you could hear it actually being said. Holy St. Paul, you're in jail for three years. What do you have? 
what do you have? How can you say that? I have everything I need and I am bound. And you're in prison and you're basically, you know, in prison in those days, they didn't feed you necessarily very well. They didn't take care of you. It wasn't like uh, some modern state, right? So what do you have? He says, I have everything and I am bound. St. Paul is not lying. He does because he has God. He has Christ within him. Do you see how a person can discipline himself, how he can be conditioned? In other words, he can be freed from the things of this world and voluntarily be impoverished in a good way, right? That's a blessing. Third one, third theological dimension. The third reason for the theological dimension, the third reason for the theological dimension uh, to one practicing voluntary poverty for Christ is that he establishes dependence on Christ at each moment, all right? So at each moment in his life, he's totally dependent on Christ. And that kind of dependence is very desirable. We don't want to be dependent on anything but Christ. He depends on the providence of God. And by this method, self-confidence and self-assurance is wiped out. Did you know that self-confidence is not something that's desirable? Did you know that self-assurance is not to be desired? It's exactly the opposite of what our, te our culture teaches, right? We don't want confidence in ourselves and assurance. That's arrogance. That's a, that's a boding... Uh, a bit, uh, let's say, a, a, a growing and, and cultivation of arrogance and delusion, right? It's arrogant, he says, to say, I have plenty. I don't need anyone. A lot of us do that. I, I, don't, need, I don't want anybody. I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't want to be around anybody. I'm just going to go. I'm, I'm good. Leave me alone. I have a full refrigerator. I have my bank accounts. Such self-confidence and self-dependence are both forms of idolatry. So people say, well, there's no idolatry anymore. Oh, really? Right here. Self-confidence and self-dependence. In other words, not dependence on God, not confidence in his provisions and his uh, uh, providence, right? Not seeking the kingdom of heaven and all else will be added. And we have no doubt that he will add everything that we need if we seek the kingdom of God. That's not what's happening here. We have self-confidence and self-dependence. In other words, idolatry. We're, so, we're worshiping ourselves. We're worshiping our abilities, our you know, desires. We are not talking about social security. Here. We're not talking about provisions that are necessary to cure involuntary poverty of our neighbor so that we don't have, we don't have poor and destitute people. I mean, society works in Greece, the social society. The government is much involved in providing for everybody in, in, in Greece, etc. He's not talking about that. He says, we're talking about the people who boast. I have everything. I have stocks, bonds, insurance policies, bank accounts. I have nothing to fear. This is the fool who speaks like this. It's a terrible thing to put your hope in pieces of paper. It's a terrible thing to put your hope in pieces of paper. My friends, we must depend on God, not on ourselves. One who is voluntarily poor has no choice but to put all this trust in God. When he's in a tough situation, he says, God did not die. He is watching out for me. He's watching over me. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. In a place of green pasture, there he made me to dwell. Beside the water of breath, I can nurture me. The man who is confident in his net worth says, so what if God dies? So what if God does not exist? I don't care. I've got the money. I'm taken care of. He depends on himself. All right. So the third theological dimension here is that the impoverished, the voluntarily impoverished one for Christ. Remember, that's always there. Voluntary for Christ. He is free because he depends on Christ for everything. Number four, when I give up my riches for Christ, I transfer them to heaven. Whereas the rich man of this age does not transfer anything to heaven. Remember the words of the Lord, and you will see that this is the meaning of the gospel. Do not store up treasures on earth. Clearly, the Lord says, do not store up treasures on earth. He's not suggesting for us not to have some basic economic base. He's not saying, uh, you know, do not have savings at all for a difficult time or rainy day. That's not what he's saying. Pay attention. He does say, do not treasure hunt. What does he say in Matthew 6, 19? Do not have your hope in earthly wealth, where moth and rest, rust destroy, 
The store of your treasure in heaven where store up your treasure in heaven where there is no danger of it being stolen by thieves so do not treasure hunt do not build up wealth on this earth but in heaven saint paul writes to those christians who lost all their belongings when their properties were seized because of persecution by the anti-christian authorities how many times does that happen throughout church history many many times and it's going to happen again soon in our society it's a matter of time and not if it's when uh and he says to them as he will say to us and said to the russian new martyrs and the bulgarians and the romanians and the serbians who suffered under communism he says to all of us for ye took joyfully the spoiling of your goods you rejoiced that they came and stole and persecuted you what kind of what kind of what is this this what, where do we get this joy from they're joyful when their belongings are confiscated and stolen? Yes, absolutely. Why? As he says further on, knowing in yourselves that you have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. In other words, in heaven you have your treasure. In heaven you have your reward. In heaven you have your security. And because you know that and you live that, you rejoiced when you were made worthy to suffer and be persecuted and lose your worldly belongings because you knew you had spiritual treasures that were being uh, built up through this persecution through this suffering number five the one who burns with faith for christ does not think about the financial statements we all get financial statements don't we You're, well, this month you had this much and, uh, he sacrifices everything in a heartbeat take it take it whatever you need that's the one who has burning faith for Christ. There is a measure stick. You're wondering, where am I? How am I doing spiritually? Am I, am I doing well? There's your measuring stick. You ready to sacrifice everything in a heartbeat? You're doing really well. Can you give it up? Can you spend the money and, and give money away to whoever needs it? Is that like not even a second thought? You're doing well. You're free. If you are really hesitant, you don't want to give, you're stingy, you're, you're, as we say in Greek, chigunidis, <laughs> you better better do some doubling down on the, uh, on, uh, the selfishness and the greed. You gotta go, go back to the drawing, drawing room and say, wait a minute here, I gotta change my way, I gotta kill that, that worm that's in me that's afraid to give. We all have, to a certain degree today, because we're all rich, right, comparatively. So we see that the person who can give it in a heartbeat, he's the free one. Do you know how difficult this could be for someone who needs a large income, who has amassed great wealth? It's very hard for rich men to enter the kingdom of God. How can he suddenly confess Christ? Oh, if I confess Christ, then I'm going to lose this, I'm going to lose that, I'm not going to be liked. We see this every day as Christians, but we stay silent more silent than the fish, <laughs> Elder Athanasius, because we do not want to create waves. Unfortunately, this is the secularized church. This is the church that's outside the temple, that's going to be trampled down by the Gentiles. The ones who do not want to lose this world's treasures, reputation, for the sake of Christ, right? They're not going to have the, the immediate or the eternal benefit of being a Christian. We do not want to have any negative repercussions in our personal interest, meaning our income-producing abilities must continue at all costs. Nevertheless, when you have nothing to lose, you have nothing to fear. You can easily undergo martyrdom. Let's look at that for a second, and let's think about the last two and a half years. When you have nothing to lose, you have nothing to fear. Therefore, if you have a lot of fear, you must have a lot of things to lose. Now, you might say, well, I'm not rich. There's other things to lose that are like treasures of this world, right? So we got to double down and get some self-knowledge really quick. Because we will not be martyrs when they call us to the confessional, confess the faith. If we are attached and we're fearful. The fearful are in, in the list in the book of Revelation who will go into the lake of fire. The fearful are among the wicked. 
that go into hell because of that fear, because it means they are attached. They're attached to this world. They're not free, right? You will truly be as free as a bird if you have nothing to lose, nothing to, and you fear nothing, and you're ready to go to the martyrdom, right? You will have a tremendous flexibility when you choose not to have possessions. You're going to be free to follow Christ and confess him. Number six, two part here, two, two slides on this one. Voluntary poverty for Christ is the denial of the recreation and remodeling of the very old world. In other words, it's voluntary, as we said earlier, voluntary poverty for Christ kills the social gospel, utopia, antichrist, quote unquote, church. That's how it's fought. That's how it's eradicated. When everybody is giving up for the sake of the kingdom, then the false social gospel, uh, you know, basically taking the church down to the social level, no longer being about the eschaton, about the spiritual life, that is overcome when the Christians are voluntarily impoverished from the things of this world. None of it will be left when we enter the new world of the kingdom of God, nothing at all. Everything we're amassing, all of our houses, our cars, right? Offices, our farm, our boats, nothing, absolutely nothing will be in the new world. The new heaven and earth. Look what the apostle says. 1 Corinthians 7, 29 and 31. This I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none. And they that weep as though they wept not. And they that rejoice as though they rejoiced not. And they that buy as though they possessed not. And they that use this world as not abusing it. For the fashion of this world passeth, passeth away. All right. What, is it, what, what does the elder have to say about this path? Very interesting. We can use the things of the world. We can use them. Cars, whatever. But let's be careful. Let's not get attached to and be glued to these things. We will simply use them because the form of this world is passing away. So why should we go out and work, 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 build, buy, build, invest. Why? Why are we doing that? First, death is just around the corner. Death is just around the corner. People who remember death, they don't have a lot of interest or time to work and work and work and build and build and build and buy and invest. And, uh, they're cognizant of the vanity of all. First, death is just around the corner. Even in the absence of death, however, one must wonder, what am I striving for? What, what, what is this all about? Where am I going? What am I going to gain? I will gain nothing more than an old world, a world on its last legs, a world that will burn up. At the end, it's all going to burn up. The elder on Athos said to me, it's all garbage. Money's just garbage. It's going to be burned up. It's going to burn up at the end of the day. Okay, you know, if you use it wisely, be a steward of it, but don't think much more. It's going to burn up. This world will be replaced by a new world with a new form and a new dimension. This world will be the kingdom of God. This new world, the new heaven and earth, will be the kingdom of God. Every old thing will be renewed. Everything as we know it. That's why the man chooses voluntary poverty. The man who chooses voluntary poverty is exceedingly theological. He's exceedingly wise in God. He considers all these things, and he is free. Number seven, voluntary poverty makes the, the faithful similar to the one who became poor voluntarily. And who became poor voluntarily for our sake? Kenosis, emptying, self-emptying of himself. Who is that? Christ. So voluntary poverty makes you like Christ. God becomes poor because, because men became poor through sin. Now man, emulating God, who became poor by his incarnation, kenosis, self-emptying, he becomes wealthy. You want to be wealthy? Give it all up. You want to be wealthy? Empty yourself of the world. 
The exact opposite of the world. That's what the Lord teaches. You want wealth? Give it all up, and you'll be wealthy. How does Paul say it? For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. So man becomes an imitator of God when he is voluntarily impoverished. Now, the conclusion of this, and then we'll open it up to questions for anyone and all who have questions. I hope you're giving them over to John if you're on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube. And if you're in Crowdcast, you know how to do it. Just write it down below. Uh, questions you might have on these matters. So this voluntary poverty is how the saints lived. You might be saying, okay, fine. But how do you really do it? Give me some examples. Because I need examples. I can't figure this is too theoretical. This is too theological. All right. Are you reading the lives of the saints? There shouldn't be an Orthodox Christian who doesn't have the lives of the saints, the various tomes of the Synaxarion, right? The six, seven volumes from Ormelia or the huge like books from the Monastery of Colorado or the St. Dimitri of Orto, uh, uh, Rostov's whole series, 12 books on the lives of the saints, or the prologue from Oak Ridge, two volume, beautiful, wonderful reflections from St. Nikolai. Those books should be in the library of every Orthodox Christian. If they're serious about being like Christ, they're going to look to the saints. Look at the lives of the saints, and you will see this. You will see the voluntary poverty. That's what you will see. What are saints, if not the iconography of the gospel, or if you will, the gospel in moving pictures, the gospel in action. I love that. I love that. I love that. Thank you, Elder Athanasios. You can't understand the gospel without seeing it in action, right? In, in, in depth. So many people who call themselves Christians are intellectually Christians, are rationalists, academics, Christians, right? They think about Christ. They think about the spiritual life. They don't have communion and imitation and participation in Christ and in the spiritual life and in the gospel and in the saints. So we've got to see it incarnate. It's a continuation of the incarnation, the lives of the saints. He never left us. How did he stay with us? Well, directly in the grace of God and the mysteries, but also in the saints. He lives and breathes and talks and walks in this world, in the lives and in the persons of the saints. And yet we ignore their examples. We don't read their lives. We don't follow their examples. Not wise. Not, not wise. So what's the work of the saints? It's the following. You will see the gospel in action, he says. Just like in past times when the people could not read and long before the printing press, the nomadic teachers of our church were all over the walls of the church in icons and frescoes. If you go back 1,000, 5,500 years, you'll see churches from those times, icons filled the walls, right? Especially after iconoclasm, of course, we, that's the period where we have most of the icons because they were destroyed during iconoclasm. You see they're filling up. And that's always been understood in orthodoxy that this is the gospel for the illiterate, right? So that, in, that has been from the beginning a part of the orthodox catechism. Saints everywhere. The, and the, the, the events of the gospel everywhere in icons. Same thing with the saints, right? One can find the entire service of salutations on the walls of the church, for example. And through this, the people were able to understand orthodox dogma. Similarly, just as icons have been used to teach the gospel, the orthodox gospel in application is the lives of the saints. So that ends it. That ends our little presentation tonight on this three verses, not even three. We're going to continue, of course, for a long time. But the good news is, this is the end of Lesson 11. We'll treat there from the dome of an amazing church in Greece. Um, the plan here, brothers and sisters, is one more lesson. And then we take a break, two, three weeks max, probably. And we'll announce all that next uh, in two weeks. And uh, during that time period, we're going to be working on a lot of different projects and all for your benefit. We've got books coming out and we've got conferences that we're trying to get off, finally get uh, uh, launched. 
And so a lot of a lot going on. But uh, we're gonna when we come back sometime in July, uh, maybe the end of July. And I'm really sure exactly when we're gonna start again. But it'll be every Tuesday, not every other Tuesday, and it will be two chapters every time. Obviously, we're gonna have to pick and choose what we're gonna share with you. So you need to get the book if you want the full impact of this course, as we've said. Uh, so we need to um, start reading the book. If we don't have it, we need to get it and start reading it. Uh, but we're going to cover more ground every time. Now, this lecture was 100, was an hour and 46 minutes. My guess is that trying to cover two chapters will probably lead us into over two-hour lecture, which is can be really tiresome uh, for some, you know, I don't, I'm not something I really desire to do, but I want to cover the material. But we have to cho choose, obviously, and hopefully in this way we'll get through the five volumes, through the Book of Revelation in double the time, well, actually triple the time than we have in the last 11 weeks. We started off this way. I think it was beneficial. We, uh, we did it in such a way that people can ease into it. They can get the foundation laid properly. We're going to spend more time on each, each verse and each uh, uh, you know, lesson. Uh, but then we're going to speed it up now, and we're going to do it in this way. And then the uh, the Orthodox extend Orthodox Jesus extended podcast will go to Thursdays every other week with our question and answer. So we'll do Thursday Orthodox Jesus podcast. Next week, orth uh, question and answer. Next Thursday, Orthodox Jesus podcast. And that way, we can get ahead on the Book of Revelation. Still do the podcast every other week. And still have our question and answer sessions every uh, uh, Thursday. And, of course, we'll be taking your questions every Tuesday and Thursday in this lesson and in the Orthodox Jesus podcast. So I think we're going to have you covered for your questions. We'll be able to answer them. And you can always, of course, reach out to us in Patreon and send us uh, you know, questions. And we will hopefully be able to get, get there for you. All right? So let's open it up to some questions. I think I just saw a question fly by. Oh, there it is. Yeah. All right. Gregory has a question. How do we in the world practice voluntary poverty? To what degree? The widow gave all she had, her whole means of if So if my rent is due on Monday, should I give all my money to the church on Sunday and have nothing to pay my rent? Am I to do this and then hope uh, in a miracle? Or is this tempting God? Forgive me, this may be a foolish question, but I often fail to discern. All right, so Elder Athanasius gave us, and I wasn't able to present everything, but he gave us some tips on how to navigate. If you were paying attention, I'm not saying you weren't, but maybe it's just, we've, you know, it's hard to digest so quickly. He gave us some examples. Uh, so he, he, he qualified some things. Um, and let me let me get those at least one of those references in front of me again. So, for instance, he says um, not, in, in theological dimension number three uh, that voluntary poverty establishes dependence on Christ at each moment, and the self confidence and self dependence are are are, are forms of idolatry. And then he says. Of course, we're not talking about Social Security or some provisions that are necessary to cure involuntary poverty. All right, we're not talking about the basics, the, the basics that we need to provide. So voluntary poverty does not mean you are literally penniless. It means that you do not search for and live for that which is beyond the necessary things of this world, right? The Lord says, seek the kingdom of heaven and all else will be provided you all. You don't have to worry, he says, about what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink. The Lord will provide for you. If you seek the kingdom of God, if you seek to live according to his commandments, you don't play, you're not double-minded. You're not, you know, lying to, to yourself and presenting yourself as really faithful, but inside you, you have all these doubts and, oh, is it, okay, if I do that, I'm really, is he really to provide? Uh, and you come to these crossroads and you choose, you know, always to, to punt, to the human security and not the divine. You, I mean, this is something that you you would need to work with on a, with a spiritual father through these various challenges and how to navigate. But so he's saying, look, there's 
there's those things that we're going to provide to have not to have utter destitute poor people. We're not that's not that's not going to happen in a Christian society. It shouldn't happen. We're talking about he says people who boast, people who put their all their trust in themselves in their money, right? The one who is voluntary poor has no choice but to put all his trust in God. That person obviously is still synergy. He's not going to be lazy. He's not going to be foolish. He's not going to be, uh, you know, walking away from things provided by God. Uh, so you work and you provide for the needs and you pay your, your expenses, but you're not attached to them. You don't live for them. All right. That's what I would, how I would answer you. You're not going to go and throw your money away and then you're responsible in order to stay in a house. You're responsible to come up with the rent and have your children and wife provided for that's not the kind of thing that you would walk away with i mean ideally as the lord said we would sell everything and follow after him but the apostles the early church they provided for their for everyone right they weren't like negligent in providing for their basic needs they had everything in common in the acts of the apostles we see they had everything in common but they worked for that somebody would work for that right they didn't just magically fall down from like mana in the heavens so it is, I think, the, the, the key here, and there's probably other references that we could bring back up to your memory here from, from the elder, but uh, for instance, here in dimension number four, remember the words of the Lord, and you will see that this is, mean, this is the meaning of the gospel. Do not store, store up treasures on earth. But then he says, he's not suggesting for us not to have some basic economic base, something saved for, for a time of need, for a rainy day. But he does say, do not treasure hunt. All right. So there's your distinction. There's your discernment here. Do not treasure hunt. Do not live for that. Do not put your trust in that. Right. But be responsible. You got to take care of your basic needs. You got to take care of your family. Okay. Don't be attached to that. Don't expect that. Don't look, act like it's all on me and God doesn't exist. And I don't have to, you know, I don't turn to God for anything. I just autonomous human being. I'm walking through this earth and everything's about me. That's what's condemnable. Because you're, then you're putting all your heart in things of this world. Um, I think I answered your question. Let's see again. Um, yes, I think I've answered your question. Hopefully I've given you the criteria, but you can go back and look at the PDF, which, by the way, with the PDF has already been uploaded. All of you on Patreon, all of you who follow us uh, right now on Crowdcast, you can go right now and download the PDF I just shared online. Uh, you can look at that. It's been up for about uh, an hour. All right, next question. Why does it seem some are given more suffering than they can handle? It does seem that way, doesn't it, sometimes? The question is, are they turning to Christ? Because obviously we can't handle anything without Christ. And so if it seems like they can't handle it, it may be that they're turning away from dependence on Christ. And that's what's missing. Um, so... All of this is a pedagogy to bring us to Christ. So if we encounter these things, the suffering you're talking about, the challenges, and we understand that everything is in the providence of God, everything's pedagogical, everything's for our salvation, then we're not going to be overwhelmed by anything, but we're going to trust God as a good pedagogue, as one who's overseeing us, that he's not going to allow this thing to destroy us or overcome us. If it does seem like that, it's because we're not trusting him, we're not turning to him. We don't feel his providence and his care. We're filled with anxiety and all the rest. And that's a choice we make, right? It's, it's, it is, yes, people who fall into that, it becomes a habit, it becomes a way of life. They're, they're constantly complaining or whatever. Yes, but they can always turn. We're free to always turn and say, help me, save me. I'm, just, I'm sinking. Uh, I'm trusting myself and I'm falling. Please save me like in so many uh, examples in scripture and in church history. Uh, somebody's asking me to, uh, and I was, I, I was intending to do that, but it's always hard to find the right spot, uh, to say a few words about Frank Atwood, now great schema monk, a friend. So if you've been following our podcast back to last summer, you'll remember that I did a, a Orthodox podcast, Ethos podcast on the, the, case of Frank Atwood, who is his name uh, in the church is Anthony. And he was on death row, or still in death row. 
uh, for um, murder, which he did not commit. And there's much evidence to show that he did not commit that. Unfortunately, that it's not been entertained. There have been many, many petitions and uh, legal maneuvers to try to get the court to reconsider. And there was a great struggle here in the last six months, year, to avert the execution. Unfortunately, tomorrow morning, 10 a.m. Arizona time, uh, the schedule is for him to be executed. And he has uh, been tonsured uh, yesterday, I think, into the great schema. In other words, he became a monk at the end of his life. And everyone, uh, uh, he's not far from us here. He's in the prison here next to Florence, Arizona, in Florence, Arizona. And uh, um, it's been, for this community here all around Florence, uh, it's been a very tragic and, and intense time because of, you know, attempts, uh, um, many attempts and many prayers, many petitions uh, to avert, avert this crime, essentially, uh, that's going to be happening tomorrow. And tomorrow there'll be a lot of prayers offered around 10 a.m. Uh, supplication service uh, here is going to be offered that he uh, make it to the end as a faithful man in Christ. He wrote a really very impressive last like goodbye to everyone. Uh, talks about you know the various spiritual issues that he was facing and the, of course the upcoming execution. A very uh, uh, moving. Uh, it's been interesting to see several hierarchs in Greece who he came to know through correspondence. They've been coming out and writing a variety of things and posting things and asking people to pray for him. Uh, so anyway, that is the case. That's what's happening right now. So all of you who are listening tonight, remember him in your prayers tonight. Remember him in your prayers tomorrow at 10 a.m. Uh, that he might uh, be patient and faithful to the end. And that God would give him a good paradise. I would I would say that it is undoubtedly, if God allows it to happen, it's undoubtedly for his salvation that it is happening. Uh, that he is going to any anyone who is suffering a grave injustice to the point they're going to execute you. Now he he would be the first to say that he had got involved in a lot of bad things when he was a young man and all the rest. And he feels that this is a way to recompense that he's suffering and he's going to be executed unjustly for this crime, although he did uh, unfortunately fall into other bad uh, and uh, criminal acts. Uh, so it's kind of a um, the cross and the redemption in God that he's he's gone through this for years and years and years, this injustice. And now he will uh, find his life taken from him. God's going to allow this, so it's going to be for salvation. And anybody who suffers in this world is treated unjustly in this world. Have They have great hope in the mercy of God. They have great hope. Like we just said, Lazarus and the rich man, right? So Lazarus suffered. People were indignant. They treated him unjustly. And he was in paradise. Or the rich man who had it all went to hell. So we hope in God. We have the many examples like that in church history where those who suffered and were unjustly treated in this world uh, as many saints were they have confidence before the, the throne uh, their sins are washed away because of the injustice in many ways all right so we've said that let's go on uh, how can we do voluntary poverty while raising a family so we just kind of explained how that's nuanced francisco Campana uh, just talked uh, and answered gregory we gave some examples of how to navigate that you're going to have to provide for your family. That's a virtue. That's not becoming rich. Voluntary poverty means we don't seek after to get rich. We don't live for being rich. We forego that. We live just according to the needs and the means. Uh, and uh, we strip ourselves of this love of money and this and this uh, desire to be attached to things. And all those theological, those seven theological dimensions, if you look at them again, get the PDF or go back to the video, you'll see... Uh, he's describing, he's, 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 he's uh, illustrating, essentially, uh, the virtues that come from seeking this poverty. Now, when we say poverty, we don't mean no money whatsoever, all right? Poverty, you have something to live by, but you don't seek to get rich. You don't make it uh, your goal that I'm going to 
I work and build up a you know big sum of money. I'm going to invest it, and I'm going to do this with that. I'm going to do that with that. Uh, it doesn't become like something you think about night and day. You say, I need to work, and God will provide. And I'm, it doesn't mean you don't make money or make even a lot of money, but you don't live for that, right? And then when you have beyond your means, you provide it to others. And that's how you save your soul. And you don't become attached to the money, but you live for Christ. And you say, this money, which God has given me, let's say, I don't know, let's say somebody needs in this day and age, with five kids, they would need at least, you know, like 70, 80, 90, $100,000 to live by, at least. I mean, it depends where you are. If you're in California, New York, it could be more. I don't know, whatever. But let's say they're making 200,000, 300,000, 400,000 a year. Like they're really doing pretty well for the society. They might, they have a choice at that point. Are they going to take that extra 50 or 100,000? What are they going to do with it? They're going to invest it and try to get rich or they're going to spend it on, you know, a really nice car. Or doesn't really need it, that nice car, but really want it. I mean, there where we, there's where we start making the choices and we start the hierarchy shows and what we love shows, you know, what are we going to do? You, you got a job, you need to buy things for the job. You buy those things. You got a house, you need to provide for the family with the food and the clothing and all the rest, you know, electricity. Of course, that's not being rich. That's providing for yourself. I said earlier that we're all rich to drive home the point here that we are extremely comfortable in ways that only the king could have been comfortable 150, 250, 300 years ago, right? So let's not let's not say the rich are only the billionaires and the millionaires, right? And that's that's the point I want to make is to identify with I am one of these people. This applies to me, and I need to take care of things. But you go on in your question, Francisco. I will be heir to the family business. I struggle when I think of what I will do with that material wealth. Well, that's a very good thing to struggle with. And you should seek out examples uh, in the gospel, in the lives of the saints, to try to imitate them. And that's why he, at the end of this talk, he talks all about the lives of the saints. Because it's one thing to theoretically analyze it. It's another thing to do it. And we, in order to do it well, we need examples, right? That's why we read the lives of the saints. But think of your family business as a stewardship, as a diacono, dia, dia, as a, um, I don't know what I want to say, as a, you're like a deacon, you're a minister, you're a steward of this. And don't identify with it as mine, as I'm going to build it, I'm going to be get wealthy. I mean, live for the kingdom and see this as a passing uh, job, as a passing uh, service, as a, as a stewardship. And, and, and don't identify it and don't lust after it and don't say, I'm going to build it up. I'm going to make it, make it you know, I'm going to make it into the best and the biggest and the, you know, that, that whole thing will consume you and your life and you'll never make progress in the spiritual life. You're not going to be living for the eternal life. And so you've got to keep it at bay. You've got to say, what do I need to do with this to provide for my family? What do I need to do with this to, to keep it afloat and make it, you know, successful? And the, all the, the excesses that happen, that should be a sign that something's wrong. And, of course, as Christians, we're always, from the very beginning, in the Acts of the Apostles, of course, we have 100%, not 10%, not a tithing, 100%. That's the model. That's the standard for us. That's why this, this whole question of voluntary property, right? So that's what happens in the monasteries. People give up everything, and it's all common, and it's run by the abbot and the fathers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now you have a family. Your family is like the little monastic community. You're in charge of providing for the monastic community. So in in, in a similar way, you're uh, you're looking to to you know serve and have this uh, this family and this this little monastery house monastery to provide for it, so it can save the souls, right? It can serve its function. If you have excess, if you make three hundred thousand and you could you could live with one hundred and fifty thousand, then you should start thinking seriously about you know a large portion of that excess going to the church, going to the monasteries, the parishes, the the whatever, the services, the ministers, whatever it is in the church. That's how Christians have always lived. I mean, in Greece, so many churches were built by donations of you know families of older. Couples, they left it in their will, whatever it is. There's a variety of things, and and that's the church depends on that. Church doesn't, you know, we don't, we're not doing stock uh, and bonds and all the rest. I mean, maybe some are today, but they're they're departing from the gospel in that way. 
Uh, it's the faithful that provide. And so if you're faithful that God has blessed, then that's how you give it back. And that's how you stay free. It's spiritually beneficial, and it benefits the building up of the church. And that's how I think you can handle that and navigate that. Orthodox Phronesis has a question. What sign is it when... When, what sign is it when one of your priests, I can't, I, I don't know, I can't read that, is constantly mentioning stories that are hearsay, try to persuade you to avoid other priests' positions, persuade and persuade you to avoid a canonical monastery. Okay, I don't know what the, I can't understand this question. So please, if you want to, write me, write me at, uh, in Patreon, or write me uh, at um, orthodoxethos.com, or write me through Uncommon Mountain Press, or whatever. You can write me and send me an email and explain yourself a little bit better, because I really can't understand the question. And maybe me a so I understand exactly what we're talking about. All right. Thank you for the question, but that's how I can deal with it. Not Napalm Platypus. Thank you very much. Interesting name. How should we approach tithing in the context of this? I'm not sure what that what you mean. How should you approach it? Uh, tithing is the Old Testament standard, and unfortunately, some of the best parishes today in terms of giving are those that practice this Old Testament standard, which is 10%. Right in the New Testament, the 10% is no longer in effect. I mean, it's not the chosen path, right? It's the ideal again is the Acts of the Apostles, which is not 10%. Do you remember what happened to the the couple that came to Peter and kept money back, they dropped dead. All right, so that was a message from the Lord that here now in the New Testament, we have a higher standards. You know, he says, in the, and you've heard not to commit adultery. I tell you, not even lust in your heart, right? You heard an eye for an eye, two fools. I tell you to forgive your enemies. So the standard in the, in the, in the, with the covenant of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is to take us to another level of total commitment. So tithing would be the minimum Right? You would say, oh, tithing. I, I think the best thing is not to get into this, into a kind of, not to think of what your right hand is doing to the left, right? If you're constantly thinking, well, now I'm giving this, and I'm giving that. And, well, I've already given my money. money. I'm not going to give this now. Right? You get into the whole, that whole mentality, you're still kind of not letting go, right? Try, try to say, I'm going to give whatever I can and whatever is necessary, instead of saying, I'm only going to give this much. And then, they, you know, uh, I'm not saying that's bad. It's much better than not giving anything. But there is a higher standard in the New Testament. Dom has a question. Is it wrong to be to bet on a lotto or go to a casino? Is that seeking riches? I do not know of any example in any time, ancient or modern, of any saint who saw lotto, casino, as something that should be done for an Orthodox Christian. Obviously, it is a poor and uh, use of funds. It is a at least a gamble, if not a total waste. It is delusional. It could lead delusional in the sense that you know people get in these mindsets. Well, I'm just gonna one more, one more, one more. You know, and then I'm gonna win, I'm gonna win the jackpot. So it's 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 very bad temptation. People become gamblers. They become they lose their houses and their family, and they go broke. And there's many. Many cases of people who have ruined their life by going to casinos and playing lotto they become obsessed with it. So, for I would say, for many reasons, it is it is not the way of a Christian. It's not honorable money. Uh, it's it's a it's a it's missing the mark. It's not what we should be doing. Uh, there's something to be said for earning your salary, your money with your sweat and your and your effort and your you know hard work and then that that those funds are honorable funds if you're going to a casino trying to get money in a in a quick easy way with no pain uh or whatever you know you might however you want to want to describe that that's not honorable it's not an imitation of the saints that i i don't see any any justification for it i don't think it's virtuous i don't think it's going to lead anywhere it could lead to very bad consequences so, no, I don't think that you can say this is in the spirit of what we just talked about. 
Uh, Trench, a few researchers, Paniotis Tulatos, Constantinos Plevries, and a Russian theology professor said Christ was Greek, which would correct many issues, correct many issues in the church. Why would, it, why would that correct many issues in the church? I think it's absurd and, and laughable that somebody who calls himself a Russian theology professor would say that Christ was Greek when he was the Messiah of the Jews. I don't know what to say. And and it, <laughs> there's so many so many references to him being a part uh, one of the Hebrews born of, of, in the line of in the line of David. What are they talking about? He was a Greek. He would have been if he was a Greek at the time. He would not have been a Jew. He would not have been the Messiah that they're waiting for. He wouldn't have fulfilled the prophecies. So that's. Unbelievable, they're Orthodox Christians who believe he was a Greek. I would have to hear their arguments, of course, before I could say definitively where they're wrong. But I I, I think it's comical that, that people think that he's a he's a Greek. I don't know how, why, and whoever said that among the church fathers. Do we have church fathers saying he was a Greek? I don't know of any. So strange to me. Strange to hear that. I uh, don't know what to say. All right, over here in Crowdcast, one or two more questions, three. And then we're going to head over. Uh, we're going to head out and uh, see you on Thursday for our question and answer session. Uh, first question: There are billions of people on the planet. If Satan is not omnipresent, how is he able to tempt so many people seemingly at one time? Is it most of the demons who do this work for him? Why then do we say it? It's the devil who does the tempting. How does he visit so many people? All right, so. He uh, is just one fallen angel, but he took many with him in his fall. Uh, and we're talking many. I don't, I don't know if there's a number reported anywhere, but uh, the angels uh, are in the you know hundreds of thousands. And, and so, but it's not that they are there tempting everyone every time. Many people choose the path of the passions and no one is tempting them. No demons. No one else, but they get a taste of the the temporary sweetness of sin, and they they fall into these habits. They don't want to struggle. They don't want to sacrifice, and then they they start to live for the ego. And none of that has to be demonically inspired. It could could be people who just choose. So, so many times, I my guess is you're thinking that demons have to every every time somebody falls into some temptation, there's a demon. That's not the case. There doesn't have to be. A demonic presence every single time people fall into sin. Many times we we blame the demons, but it's all our doing. So, uh, but it certainly is not just the devil. The devil is just one of the demons of the uh, fallen angels. Uh, but again, I think a lot of that is our own doing. Right? It's all really um, the demons can, can only knock. They can only suggest. They cannot force. We have to choose sin, and we we do. I mean, when we fall into sin, it's our choice. Every single time, we choose to go into the darkness and away from the light. They, just like our Lord instructs our freedom, they can't force us. They can try to trick us. They can try to pressure us, but they can't force us. So that means we choose, right? So sometimes we, we don't need any pushing from any demon. We, we're very good at it ourselves. And, uh, I think that's that's where you know you might want to consider that, and then it makes more sense how people are falling left and right. And the less Christian virtue, the less prayer, the less examples, the more people are going to walk the other way, right? So it all goes together. And our apostasy actually brings about the rise of Antichrist. Ultimately, Christians walking away from Christ is what opens this massive hole, and the demons and the and the Antichrist uh, comes in. Uh, so again, that shows you that it's really in our hands and we're responsible for all the sin in the world. Ultimately, the devil, of course, is pushing us, prodding us, trying to trick us and all the rest. And but we choose to follow. I mean, we meaning people who follow their pastors, they choose voluntarily to follow in that in that way. All right. Next question. Vasily and Anna, your blessing father, can you please define the word woe? Is it meant to mean beware? 
So alimono in Greek is kind of woe. Uh, uh, um, it basically is uh, uh, woe to you. It's like, you know, God help you or, or um, this, you know, you will be, you're, you're on the path of destruction. Uh, you are, you are, um, yeah, I don't know another word exactly like woe, uh, but it's, yeah, it's basically, I guess, beware is one way to say that. Um, I, I can live with that. It's probably a multifaceted, actually. I don't think it's as simple as beware. It's kind of a warning, like, this is this is destructive. This is a curse. You're going to, you're going in the wrong direction. And when I get the part, would it be negligent if I decided not to take the V? Take the V. Stop providing for family. I'm not, your question doesn't really is not complete. I need more. I'm much more complete. It's hard for me to understand what you're asking. Would it be negligent to to not provide for the family because I I didn't take the V? Uh, I, I think that that's exactly the crossroads that somebody is one of the examples of the today's crossroads where you have to trust in God and not walk against him. Obviously, that's not going to be negligent. It's going to be fulfilling the will of God and being faithful. Um, so many people have, not many, but a sizable amount of people at least have reached out to me over the last two years and said, I refused. I walked away from my job. God took care of it. I've heard many of these stories. I was able to get a better job. I moved down to so and so, and I met my you know my future husband. I got one person like that. Uh, she refused to get the V, and she went to another place, and she met her husband, and she's going to get married soon. So, trust in God never is negligence, and you have to have the hierarchy, and you know voluntarily going the path of delusion and demonically demonic methodology which is what's behind the v uh is is not uh is not an option for somebody who wants to be faithful and god will provide if you are faithful all right okay we have answered the questions at crowdcast let's see if we have any more in youtube and facebook no don't have any questions there we've answered all your questions apparently um I don't think I see anything else. So I appreciate your time. I appreciate your, your being here tonight. Um, is there any other announcements? I don't think so. I think we've covered everything. We'll be back on Thursday. And we hope you join us. God, help us, save us, have mercy on us, uh, and keep us by his grace. Good preparation for the Feast of Pentecost, which is coming up. We have Soul Saturday. Bring all of your koliva and the names of your loved ones who repose to the church on Friday night and Saturday morning. Uh, and then you have the Feast of Pentecost. In some places, we have the, the Feast of the uh, Holy of uh, the Holy Spirit on Monday. Uh, and then all of next week, we we are not fasting. It's a fast-free week after Pentecost. And then we'll be uh, we'll be coming back next Tuesday with our next. Uh, Orthodox Extended Podcast. Haven't decided what we're going to do down yet, uh, but we will announce that shortly, a couple days. And then the, in two weeks from today, we will be finishing up this part of our lecture series on Book of Revelation. Uh, and then after that, we'll be taking a break for several weeks. Uh, so join us for that, and we'll announce the new start date in July. And we'll uh, Give you more details about how we're going to approach the book and how, how much you know what pace we're going to keep uh and uh yeah god bless you thank you and we'll see you uh on thursday god willing let's uh we'll chant the interpari into the holy cross and then we'll uh we'll sign out god bless <clears throat> So son kiri ai ton lon su ke vlogi son ting kleronomi an su ni kanti vasilemsi katan var var on dorumenos ke ton son filato via tu stavrusu Politev ma